So let's suppose that's a sort of rough and ready picture of what hope is. How does it help in the face of something like the Anthropocene? So let's say we hope for carbon justice, right? That was the thing that we said we wanted, two-degree guardrail, fair distribution of what remains. Say we hope for that. That means, according to what I was just telling you, that we believe it's possible, certainly seems possible. We want it. We even think we're morally required to go for it in this case. Um, and we tenaciously focus on that possibility. We consider it, we fantasize about it, we imagine what it would be like to get there. We think about how our hopes would be dashed if we didn't get there and what the consequences would be. Um, but we keep it rational. We don't go into a kind of optimism that suggests that our evidence is different than it is. So it's a hopeful pessimism, if you will. Um, and how does that avoid getting into demoralization in the way that I suggested sometimes we can in the face of long odds. Well, I mean, if you're tenaciously focused on the positive possibility, I think it's very psychologically natural to then start thinking about, as I said before, pathways, ways in which you might be involved, or at least someone might be involved in getting to the ultimate outcome, getting out of the prison, for instance. So once you start thinking that way, you kind of build yourself and maybe your community, the people working with you, into the hope. So you start hoping not just for this outcome, but for that outcome and that I contribute to it in some way. So I hope to contribute through all of this effort to the bringing about of this outcome. So with respect to carbon justice, all the little things I try to do, I want them to make a difference, something we hear a lot from a lot of people, certainly my students. I want to make, how do I make a difference? That seems really key, a kind of consequentialist picture. Now, I think that when we look closely at the odds and how much we can really do as individuals, even if we say, yeah, I'm hoping to make a difference for carbon justice, we could still face demoralization. We could still face these long odds and sort of think, yeah, actually, it's not going to matter much. So here's the final twist. I'm talking about hope for specific outcomes and just skipped hope as a virtue for the sake of time. I can go back to that if we want to in the question and answer. So here's the final twist. Um, as we know, there are some systems, especially in nature, but also in culture and commerce, that are not linear systems. This is something that actually comes up in a lot of the discussions here, I think, in the long now context. Sometimes it's not just about aggregates and linear progressions, but rather about feedback loops and sudden shifts and thresholds and trigger points and so forth. Now, what is the chance that you and your the people you convince around you or the people who are working around you for carbon justice are going to be on a tipping point or a threshold. Very small, right? Even smaller than the possibility that I was talking, the probability of that one possibility I was talking about before, that you'll make some sort of difference. The thought here is it's still possible. It's still possible that you'll make this huge difference, that your small actions will come at just the right moment such that the system trips in, across a tipping point or across a threshold, and you make a big difference. I think if we focus in this hopeful way on that mere possibility, and it is possible in many cases, then it will be very difficult to feel demoralized. Then it will feel, be very difficult to think, oh, I'll just sort of let this one slide. I will opportunistically go ahead and burn this carbon when I really don't need to. Um, let me just finish by illustrating this with a case, and now we're going to go back to the food situation, which is what the book was in part about. So we know that industrial animal agriculture is one of the worst greenhouse gas producers. It's worse than the entire transportation sector combined. Um, we also know it's kind of more intuitive in this context to see what I was talking about with thresholds and nonlinearity. So there's a kind of chunkiness about the supply chain in a huge opaque system like this, where it's not the case that when I stop and get a chicken sandwich, uh, you know, which is made up of maybe one fiftieth of a chicken, um, depending on what other things they put in there, uh, that somehow one fiftieth of a chicken dies, right? So it's not this direct correlation. Even if I have 50 sandwiches, it might not be the case that one chicken dies. There's you know, this thing going along, this system, and it hits thresholds, and at some point, some choice does have this big effect. 100,000 chickens are ordered, and the farmer produces them, and they become part of the 45 billion chickens that are processed every year. Um, 
So suppose I really care about the climate or about animals or about both, and I decide to give up on animal products. Um, facing these huge numbers makes it hard to be optimistic, makes it hard to think that you're going to be um, making a difference. That demoralization threat comes in. And what I want to suggest is that we can sort of generate, and I already sort of casually made it, but now I'm going to formally make it, um, a moral argument, what Kant calls a moral argument for lived hope that would help us avoid demoralization in this kind of case and in Anthropocene cases generally. So you can't get through a talk by a philosopher without one effort at a stepwise argument. So here's premise one. Oppie, this is the guy who's thinking about opportunistically, you know, he's demoralized and he's like, I'm just going to eat that chicken sandwich because it doesn't make a difference. I do care about the factory farm system. I'm morally opposed to its continuation, but I'm tempted by the thought that if I make a difference, it's a minuscule difference, a tempting thought that we all have, surely. It would be demoralizing in that way that I was mentioning for Oppie to have, not to have some sort of hope that his eating choices or the choices of those he influences have a significant effect on the factory farm system. So I was suggesting, unless we can focus on the positive possibility that we make a significant difference, we might face demoralization. Demoralization is morally undesirable, especially if the end in question is something we think is morally required, or duties to future generations and so forth. So given the facts about the system that is chunky and not linear in the way I was suggesting earlier, suggest that there's a moral advantage in having rational hope that at least one of the food choices you make throughout your life, maybe you have 20 or 30,000 choices left, at least one of those choices is going to be a threshold choice where you actually get to decide whether the system shunts forward, whether those 100,000 chickens get ordered or not. The threshold chicken is yours at that moment. You don't know which, and so you sort of then try to abstain across all of your choices and have this hope that one of them makes a huge difference, 100,000 chickens um, or not, depending on how you choose. So other things equal rational hope that at least one of the food choices he makes or influences is a threshold choice becomes morally justified. So for moral reasons, we can hope for that. It's not, it's not optimism. It's not the claim that that is going to happen. That would be crazy, right? Think about the odds. But I'm suggesting it's both morally justified there's a com compelling moral reason to focus on that mere possibility in the way that hope does in order to keep us from being demoralized. <laughs>